Hello, and welcome to Western Civ, episode 208, Continental Ambitions. Last time, after the deaths of Prince Arthur, Queen Elizabeth, and his chief finance minister, Richard Bray, Henry descended into an ever-deepening quagmire of suspicion, mistrust, and paranoia. Unable to command his subjects to love him, Henry seemed content to ensure that they were totally bound to him financially. If he could not bind his subjects to him through affection, he would make rebellion prohibitively expensive. At the same time, the death of Arthur had left Henry in a bit of a pickle. What to do with Catherine? If he sent her packing, then he would need to return her dowry. But if he married her to Prince Henry then he would lose that bargaining chip. In this episode, we watch as Henry tries his best to exert English diplomatic muscle across the continent, where Spain, France, and the Holy Roman Empire are currently locked in a struggle over Italy. As always, if you're interested in more content, check out the website at westernsibpodcast.com. For ad-free versions of the show, We do have a Patreon page for a dollar a month. You get ad-free versions at patreon.com forward slash Western Civ Podcast. And if you love ancient and classical history like I do, check out the subscriber feed for a more detailed Western Civ 2.0 at glow.fm forward slash Western Civ. Toward the end of summer 1504, the Dean of St. Paul's arrived in London from Rome. This was the man, nominated by Julius II, to bring to England the papal dispensation for Prince Henry's marriage to Catherine of Aragon. And he had come empty-handed. Henry was no doubt furious, and fired off a letter that barely concealed his irritation. Despite the Pope's promises and Henry's 4,000-pound contribution to the Pope's proposed crusade, nothing had been done. Henry had done everything that his ambassadors said needed to be done to seal the deal, and still nothing. But actually, Henry was wrong. Pope Julius had consented to the dispensation. It's just that he first sent the papal bull to Spain. From Julius's perspective, this all made perfect sense. Spain was, after all, far more involved in Italian politics than England. The bull, however, was also sent to Spain first, because it was intended to please Ferdinand, who had insisted that his daughter had consummated her first marriage. This was, by the way, a change that came about in the opinion of Spain after the death of Isabella. The bull proclaimed loud and clear, Catherine was no virgin. But how then could he dispense with the marriage? Well, the answer proved to be one that would really come back to haunt Prince Henry, the future Henry VIII, in the next few decades. Before the sentence reading, quote, this marriage had been consummated, end quote, Julius placed the Latin word for son, meaning perhaps. So he left it up to how you wanted to interpret it. Julius's intention was to please both Spain and England and just get the thing done. In the end, he pleased no one, and 25 years later, this ambiguity would become the spark for the English Reformation. So in the end, it was the Pope who lost England for St. Peter. Just, it wouldn't be the Pope sitting in Rome at the time. Now, as I mentioned, on November the 26th, 1504, Isabella, queen of Castile, and Catherine's mother had died. Her death had major ramifications for Europe, 
as we'll soon get into when we talk about the future Holy Roman Emperor Charles. But of course, it also turned Catherine's world upside down. Isabella's marriage to Ferdinand had melded the kingdoms of Castile and Aragon. But her death meant that Castile technically should have reverted to Catherine's older sister, Juana, who was reported to be insane. She was married to Philip of Burgundy, son to Emperor Maximilian. And their progeny, that of Philip and Burgundy and Juana, Charles of Ghent, would someday become the most powerful man in Europe, Charles of Spain, and the future Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V. Now, Ferdinand, of course, he could remarry if he wanted to. But the question was, did he have a fair claim to Castile on his own at this point? He decided he did, and was determined to rule Castile in his daughter Juana's name. Now, for Catherine, what this all meant is that there was no longer a guarantee that Henry VII was allying himself to a united Spain through the marriage contract. Now, it was one thing, of course, to solder yourself to Spain, the United Kingdom, the ruler of Naples, the dominator of the New World. It was quite another thing if the marriage contract just allied yourself to the small kingdom of Aragon. Now, of course, as always, we can't forget our other player in this whole game, and that's the Earl of Suffolk. Claimant to the English throne, Suffolk was still in Aachen in Burgundy. As always, he remained high on the list of Henry's targets. Before her death, Isabella and Ferdinand had been trying to get their hands on him, hoping to use him as another bargaining chip to keep Henry interested in an alliance against France. And they almost got him in February of 1504, about nine months before Isabella died. But Suffolk was tipped off at the last moment. He fled to the ancient principality of Gilders, adjacent to the Low Countries. At that time, this tiny kingdom was still allied with France, and France very much wanted to keep Suffolk independent and in the game. So for the moment, he was safe. So this is the scene, then, in late 1504, when Henry decides he's going to really enter European politics and he's going to buy himself a seat at the table. He seems to have decided at this point that he was done dealing with Spain. He was going to ditch Ferdinand and instead back the Austrian Habsburg claim to Castile through Isabella's sister's son, Charles. In fact, Henry was going to fund the entire expedition to facilitate said takeover. As an aside, I'm going to step back here for a second. Now, for the moment, the Habsburg claim can't go through Charles. The Habsburg claim still has to go through Maximilian, because, of course, Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian is still alive. I'm kind of melding the two here, to make the story easier to digest as we go along. But just know, Maximilian is still the key player on the table at this point, because he doesn't get to inherit anything until his father passes. Now, this switch has baffled historians for centuries, because Henry was now putting his money almost wildly on the table. I mean, to just give bribes to the Pope and the Emperor. I mean, that's one thing. But to say now that he's going to fund an expedition that's going to be intended to, I mean, essentially take over Spain? I mean, we're talking about a whole new ballpark 
of money here. How in the world did Henry get his hands on so much cash? Of course, the problem historians face is that since Henry was always going around the exchequer, no one really knows how rich he was. Perhaps this was all a massive bluff. But he did have many sources of income. This we know. But then the question comes up. Did Henry VII have another source of secret income? Was he involved in one of the first ever clandestine cartel situations? So this takes us a tad bit of field, but I think it's interesting and worth it. There are allegations that Henry VII was engaged in what today we would say was the equivalent of large-scale drug cartel operations. The substance at the heart of all this speculation is called alum. Alum, a natural astringent and antiseptic, was prized for its medicinal and cosmetic properties in the Middle Ages. But more importantly, it was indispensable to the textile trade. England produced a lot of wool. Some of it was cheap and exported to the low countries as is. But the finer quality wool needed to be dyed. And alum was the only available dye fixture at this point in history. In essence, it kept your red shirt red even after you washed it in the bucket or the, the stream or whatever. Alum was big business. In short, it was a mineral without which the Western economy would grind to a halt. Now, alum was plentiful in the Eastern Mediterranean. But the Eastern Mediterranean, as we're going to get into in a lot of depth in the coming months, was under Turkish control. In the West, there was only one source of alum, the papal mines at Tulfa near Rome. So the Pope had a monopoly on the substance and could charge whatever he wanted, especially because he decided it was in Jesus' interest to ban any and all alum trade with the Turks. You know, that is unless... Somebody shipped alum in from the east, disguised its origin in England, and then re-imported it to the Low Countries. Again, it was illegal to trade with the Ottomans, so that's where all this becomes against the law. Allegedly, the middlemen for all this were the Frescobaldi Bank and King Henry the seventh. It was illegal, according to the Pope, who obviously stood to make a ton of cash by maintaining his monopoly. But Henry also stood to make a lot of money out of the racket. How much of this is true versus speculation remains impossible based on the most recent historical information to say. But isn't it kind of fun to imagine Henry VII as like the medieval equivalent of Pablo Escobar or something. All this adds a further level of sophistication and mystery to Henry's vast 108,000-pound loan to the Archduke in the spring of 1505. Henry was unwilling to involve England directly in the military affairs of Europe. But with his money... He wanted to remain at the heart of power politics. His goal now was to get the best marriage alliance he could for Prince Henry. And, for the moment, he had determined that alliance lay with the Emperor, not Spain. There is one new factor here, though, that I need to mention. Previously, when King Henry negotiated these marriages for Prince Henry... The prince was a boy. Now he was an adolescent and ready to make his opinions known. Canon law declared that marriages prior to puberty, 
12 for girls, 14 for boys, were dissolvable because they could not be consummated. Marriages made after that age were indissoluble. Of his own free will, Prince Henry declared that he would not ratify a marriage contract with Catherine. It was, quote, null and void. He wrote this statement out and signed it before witnesses. And he did it the day before his 14th birthday. In other words, he voided the marriage contract one day before it became permanent. If King Henry was going to marry his son to anyone going forward, he was going to have to deal with his son's personality. Henry did not put much stock in Prince Henry's secret, so far, declaration. For him, it was just another card to play to get Ferdinand to pony up the balance of the dowry and move the marriage forward. As of now, of course, it's worth noting that while Ferdinand had paid a substantial amount of the dowry, he hadn't paid it all. Henry was adamant that the wedding was not going to take place until the balance of the dowry was paid in full. If the circumstances changed, then King Henry might produce the secret signed declaration and, you know, just chalk up the whole thing to the impetuousness of youth. But meanwhile, King Henry continued to grow impatient with King Ferdinand. He summoned de Puebla to an audience and simply unloaded on the man. In a violation of their treaty, Ferdinand had forbidden English ships to leave Spanish ports, carrying any goods. Moreover, Henry thundered, where were the other 100,000 crowns promised for Catherine's dowry? If Ferdinand expected to move forward on any of this, how could he do so without meeting any of his obligations? De Puebla stood silent while Henry vented and took his leave without saying a word. A few days later, de Puebla returned to Richmond. He found Henry perfectly calm, and the two discussed affairs of state as though the tirade had never occurred. This was but another example that Henry was beginning to lose his grip on reality, that his isolation was taking a toll. Throughout the summer of 1505, there was sporadic fighting on the continent that was relevant to Henry. In July, Philip of Burgundy captured the Duchy of Gilders, and with it, the castle in which the Earl of Suffolk was being held. Hearing the news, Henry sent Philip of Burgundy another non-returnable loan in the amount of 30,000 gold pieces. The message was clear. Henry wanted Suffolk. Henry's agents continue to circle around the Earl, who is now a prisoner of Philip in all but name. Always prone to flights of self-delusion, Suffolk veered from outright panic to flashes of grandiose optimism. He still, for whatever reason, seemed to believe that he could dictate the terms of his return to England, a belief that Henry did much to encourage. It did him a lot less good, after all, if Suffolk committed suicide. Henry wanted the guy alive. He wanted to know how much further the conspiracy went. Philip was not about to give Suffolk up, though. Heck, Henry had paid him 138,000 pounds in quote-unquote danger money in 1505 alone for Suffolk. Philip wasn't going to give up a cash cow like that. Then the wheel of fate turned. On the evening of January 15th, 1506, icy storms raged across southern England. The gales in the English Channel were tremendous. Evidently, the bronze eagle that topped the steeple of St. Paul's was ripped off and flung out across the city. We don't often think of such storms as good news, but in this case, the tempest was about to bring a stroke of good luck for King Henry. You see, 
Philip of Burgundy happened to be out at sea that night, attempting to cross to Spain. His ship ran aground on the Dorset coast. Suddenly, the man with the power to deliver up Suffolk was in Henry's clutches. There is something ironic about the turn of events, as Henry was the one who was financing the voyage in the first place. Now, thanks in part to his money, Henry found himself with an extraordinary advantage. Henry was delighted to find Philip shipwrecked on his shores. He sent word to Philip to be lavishly entertained until he could arrive. He wanted the Holy Roman Emperor in good spirits, after all. Once Henry arrived, he was all chivalry and generosity. Of course he would take care of the wayward king. He would be only too honored to do so. But beneath the surface lurked an obvious reality. Philip was very much a prisoner. He would be held until Henry had Suffolk firmly in his grasp. The meeting between England and Habsburg Burgundy took place at the royal palace at Windsor, the ancestral home to English kingship. It would, Henry realized, be the perfect setting also for Prince Henry to be introduced to the wider European world. So, the king sent for his son. At this point, the future Henry VIII starts to emerge in what we might say technicolor. Before 1506, we do not get a sense of the man who's going to play such a larger-than-life role in both English and European politics in the very near future. In other words, by January 1506, the Henry VIII we all imagine when we think of Henry VIII starts to come into being. On January 31st, around 3 p.m., the two kings, Philip and Henry, met outside Windsor. They embraced, and it was clear that Henry was in an exceptionally good mood. Why shouldn't he be? His guest was, he said, very dear to him. In fact, as dear as his own son. Moreover, Henry claimed that he had not been this happy since the day he was crowned, and you know what? I think he was telling the truth. With Philip in tow, Henry could literally force all his dreams into reality. For Philip, the situation was a tad less desirable. Initially at Windsor, Philip spent as much time as possible closeted away as he slowly came to terms with his enforced hospitality. Finally, one day, he turned to Henry and said, quote, I see right well that I must needs do your commandment and to obey as reason will, end quote. Philip had gotten the message and come to terms with it. If he was ever going to leave Henry's gilded prison, then it would be on Henry's terms. There wasn't going to be any further negotiation, and the good old days of leeching Henry for keeping track of Suffolk were over. Philip was going to have to turn over the Earl. Now, Henry, of course, wanted more than that. If Philip's surprise arrival was a boon to Henry, then it was a disaster for Catherine. All the talk now was of a wedding, but not hers. With Philip present, Henry pressed the issue of a marriage alliance between the Habsburgs and the Tudors. Namely, that Henry's daughter Mary would be wed to Charles, the infant Habsburg heir. If all this went through, it would mean that Catherine would certainly never marry Prince Henry. 
Henry and Philip began to negotiate a new mutual defense pact that would cover literally everything Henry wanted. In it went Mary's marriage to Charles, plus King Henry's marriage to Margaret of Savoy. In terms of trade and economics, English merchants would be able to import cloth, tax, and duty-free from the Low Countries, with few, if any, concessions in return. The entire treaty was a decisive turn away from Ferdinand and Spain and towards the Habsburgs and the Empire. The treaty itself was kept a secret, while Ferdinand and the French didn't know the specifics. They knew that Philip was trapped in England and probably suspected what Henry was after. Besides, they signed their own secret defense treaty around the same time. But of course, the most important component that Henry wanted was Suffolk in his custody. Henry dispatched a veteran diplomat to the Low Countries to take possession of the Earl while he continued to entertain Philip, who understood he wasn't going anywhere until word reached Henry that Suffolk was successfully in Tudor possession. Henry maintained close contact with his diplomats all the way. Finally, news reached Henry that Suffolk was in English custody. And so, Philip was permitted to end his English vacation on April the 16th, 1506. No sooner had Philip left than cracks began to appear in the treaty. Margaret of Savoy was a committed widow and refused to even consider a marriage to Henry. For his part, Philip pleaded with Margaret to reconsider, though this had a lot more to do with Henry's money than Philip's belief that Henry would make a good husband. Philip made it to Castile, after all. But then he descended into a prolonged squabble with Ferdinand over the succession, which we will get more into when we discuss Philip's son, Charles. Then Philip, unexpectedly, died on September the 25th, 1506, under rather mysterious circumstances, and the battle over the Spanish succession would need to wait for his son to come of age. Henry did not realize at the time how much Philip's death would alter and impact his plans, and at the time he wasn't very concerned. He still believed that his daughter Mary was going to wed Charles. Moreover, if Philip was dead, then Juana, his widow, an heir to Castile, well, she was back on the marriage market. And besides, in the end, he got what he wanted, the Earl of Suffolk. On March 16, 1506, Suffolk entered Calais and was delivered into the custody of royal agents. He was transported over to London, taken through the back streets to the tower, through its gatehouse, and across the moat into its depths. He would never come out alive. And yet Henry had not made a clean sweep. Suffolk's associates had evaded Henry's clutches, among them Richard de la Pole. Richard would not suffer his brother's fate, but nor would he be king. Richard fled to Liege, where he was protected by the bishop. Said bishop then brokered Richard's flight across the continent to Bohemia, where King Ladislaus II would keep him comfortable until his death ten years later, all while drawing an annual pension from England to keep Richard safe but far from the White Cliffs of Dover. What happened to Suffolk 
once he entered the tower. We're not sure. As you might expect, Henry was not keen to publish any accounts of the intervening weeks. Certainly, I think we can say he was tortured. While technically nobles are not supposed to be tortured, such rules are rarely followed. Now, while all this was going on with Suffolk, while he was being transferred to English custody, Henry made sure that his counselors and tax collectors, Dudley et al., played by the rules. But once Suffolk was in custody, and the number one piece that might challenge Henry's authority was off the board, he just went ahead and let them off the leash. Now Henry turned his gaze towards Suffolk's remaining associates at home. One that he moved against was Lord Bergevany, who had been a perennial thorn in Henry's side in Kent. In 1506, the Crown brought an indictment against Bergevany in the court of the King's Bench. Henry was no longer wasting time. The man was arrested and brought to the Tower. So were two others, alleged to have dined with Suffolk in the days before his flight from England. And that's going all the way back to 1501. Imagine being hauled before the highest court in the land because you had dinner with someone five years ago? Five years! While this might sound insane to anyone else, to Henry, it was perfectly logical. And so, Sir Thomas Gray and Thomas Green found themselves hauled in for a dinner party half a decade ago. Green was already sick when he went in, and the tower, you know, for those accused of a crime, is far cry from the Ritz. He died on November the 5th. Gray sat in the tower until he was transferred to Calais that autumn. Everyone just assumed he was being sent there to die, whether Henry intended to speed that along or not. Now, these were just the high-profile cases. For the rest, dozens upon dozens of men accused, there would be fines. If they couldn't pay those fines, and that, by the way, was the plan, then there would be debts, and interest, and more debts, and more interest, etc., etc. The genius behind the system was to make sure that anyone whose loyalty was not beyond reproach, and even some whose loyalty was, remained in perpetual debt. They would pass these debts on to their children, and their children's children, and so forth and so on, until the crown saw fit to cancel them. In the meantime, everyone was just on permanent bail. If they misstepped at all, then the crown just called the debt, threw them in prison, and confiscated their lands. If the debts were called, these men were ruined, and they knew it. But it went beyond that. Many of these men didn't have the resources to post their own bonds. As a result, they needed friends and extended family members to stand as surety for them. So if they made a mistake, they risked not only ruining themselves, but the lives of all those who stood with them. And that created an intense amount of social pressure for men to behave. And beyond that, Without even hiring them, Henry put spies everywhere. Men who stood as guarantors watched their friends like hawks. It was in their interest as well for their friends to behave. And this belies the cold reality of Henry's system post-1506. No longer were Henry's ministers after recalcitrant Yorkist nobles. They were after anybody and everybody they could get. Next time, we wrap up the story of Henry VII. As always, if you're interested in additional content, check out the website at westerncivpodcast.com and all the different subscription feeds from there. <laughs>